فعاش القلب إخلاصا وصرت تحومك الطير تحلق في ثقافات وتنهل من روبا الخير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam His household, his companions We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them To bless every one of us and to grant us goodness My brothers, my sisters Indeed it brings about a lot of joy To be in this beautiful masjid in Bulwayo after more than a year, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannatul Firdaus. And in the same way that he has gathered us in his house, may he gather us in the presence of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And may he grant us success of this world and the next. Ameen. My brothers and sisters, across the globe, you will find that Muslims, like ourselves, living in countries that are predominantly non-Muslim and being given the freedom to follow their faith, their religion. This freedom is something that is unique. It is something that we do, knowingly or unknowingly, take for granted. And many people don't speak about it. We're living in a secular country. It's not a Muslim country. The countries are not governed by Islamic law, not in the least. But in fact, they have greater rights than almost all those countries that are predominantly Muslim or ruled by Muslims. And that is a matter that you can study and check. I have studied it very deeply and checked. So let's not be fooled. Let's thank Allah. And let's understand that we have to, in the same way that we're given the right to follow our faith, agree, admit, and allow others to follow what they believe is correct. Because if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be allowed to follow Islam. Some countries that are quite advanced are beginning to reverse this. And one of the reasons is because of us. Sometimes we become so abusive in the way we speak as though Islam is supposed to be forced on everyone. Living in a country that's not even Muslim. There is no passage in the Quran, no suggestion in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ saying that Islam should be forced upon anyone. In fact, the value system of Islam makes mention in the Quran, La ikraha fi din qad tabayyana rushd min al ghay. There is no compulsion at all when it comes to entry into the fold of Islam. You cannot force someone. People should be free. Wa qulil haqq min rabbikum. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ O Muhammad, peace be upon him, tell them that the truth has been revealed from your Lord or by your Lord. Whoever wants should believe and whoever wants doesn't have to believe. But at the end, their answerability lies with Allah. People get upset. Why does Islam teach that there is an afterlife where perhaps people may be punished? The reality is you are free to believe and you are free not to believe. You can go and take any other system. That's yours. It's fine. It may not be fine with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but between you and I, your answerability is not to me. It's to Allah. But as a human being, I allow you the freedom just like you've allowed me the freedom. If I didn't allow it to you or vice versa, there would be war and chaos across the globe. So there are people who believe 
that if you are not a Muslim, I must fight you, I must hurt you, I must even go to the extent of killing you, a'udhu billah. There are groups who believe this and they use verses of the Quran that were revealed at the time of the Prophet ﷺ to justify this type of behavior, not understanding that the same Quran explains to you the relationship you are supposed to be having with those around you and that everyone who is not a Muslim is in actual fact supposed to be looked at as a not yet Muslim. What does that mean? I'm supposed to have hope. The enemy of Islam at the time was Abu Jahl. The Prophet, peace be upon him, used to pray for him. Oh Allah, guide this man to Islam. Subhanallah. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, who was he prior to Islam? He was an enemy. He was one of the worst. He went out not to plot or plan the killing of an ordinary Muslim, but the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what happened? A prayer, a dua, the softness of the heart of the Prophet, peace be upon him. The invocation of Allah, when he invoked Allah, saying, Oh Allah, guide this man to Islam. And within a short space of time, the man comes to say, Ya Rasulallah. Now when someone says, Ya Rasulallah, automatically there is belief in the heart that this person considers the messenger a messenger. They could have come in and said, Ya Muhammad, astaghfirullah, if they wanted to. That was his name, yes indeed. But for someone to say, Ya Rasulallah, it shows a level much higher than a person who just addresses like anyone else. So he says, Inni ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu annaka abduhu wa rasuluhu. Subhanallah, I bear witness there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And I bear witness that you are the messenger of Allah. They were shocked, they were surprised, they were amazed. But there is nothing shocking for Allah. My brothers and sisters, the non-Muslims we have around us, I swear by Allah, they have every right to believe what they want even though we may disagree with them completely on those matters. They have every right to believe what they want. And just like you have the right to believe what you want, they will go to their churches while we will go to our masjids. And to be honest, they have that right. We may continue in our da'wah. What is da'wah? Propagation. Propagation, we respectfully discuss matters. I have a question for you, my beloved brother. Brother in what? In humanity. People get angry when you call a Christian or a Jewish person or a Hindu or an atheist or an agnostic, my brother or my sister. They get angry. They get upset. For what? Weren't you astray some time back? Weren't your parents or great-grandparents astray some time back? Someone somehow respectfully convinced them that, you know what? Let's talk about this. So tell me more about your faith. I believe you say this and you say that. Explain to me why and let me explain to you why. But my brothers and sisters, there is a major disaster amongst us. We don't know Islam good enough. We don't know it well enough to even ask them a single question. They will bowl us mid-wicket and we will just look their mouth aghast. Ah, That's it. Because why? We know nothing. People tell you, you know what? The Quran is filled with verses of hate. It has in it. And they will rattle them out to you. They will read to you five, ten verses and show you here they are. And you say, oh, oh, I didn't even know. Why don't you Google verses of hate in the Bible? You'll find worse verses. You'll find verses that you can't believe exist. But they're in the Bible. All you need to do, pick up your phone while you're talking and Google verses of hate in the Bible or in the Torah, etc., etc. You'll find Many verses, but remember these verses in actual fact are not verses of hate. When they are taken out of context and misunderstood and intentionally used to brainwash people, then definitely the ignorant fall. The ignorant begin to think that yes, these are verses of hate. Not at all. They are not. And there are no verses of hate. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. The Quran is extremely balanced. And we believe as Muslims that even the Bible in its original form is extremely balanced. We believe the same about the Torah and the Talmud, etc. We believe exactly the same in its original form. It was absolutely fair and balanced. My brothers and sisters, we take for granted the fact that we are Muslimin living with such freedom. 
Subhanallah. We have the houses of Allah, such as this one, a massive, beautiful, lovely place. Absolutely superb, filled with serenity, such that the moment you enter the gate, if you have a heart filled with the love of Allah, you begin to feel the calmness and the serenity. Subhanallah. I tell you what, we sometimes don't make use of it. Allah will take it away at some point. It's not going to stay forever. It's not going to stay forever. That's a promise of Allah. When He gives you something, He will take it away. He's not, it's not going to be there forever. Because there is something called Ajalullah. The limit, the, the, the time that is fixed by Allah for everything. When it comes, it's not going to be delayed. I know of people living in nations that used to be totally free in terms of the rights of a, of a Muslim woman to wear a hijab. And here I'm only talking of covering the hair. It used to go beyond that in freedom. But the women didn't do it in a lot of cases. They didn't. Why? Well, you know, we are sometimes forgetful of the fact that in, as a Muslim, your focus is not on the, on the dunya, but it's on the akhirah. You are going to live the dunya, you're going to earn in the dunya, you're going to have a little bit of comfort in the dunya. You might smile when a luxury or two comes in your direction, but your focus is the akhirah because this world doesn't last more than 60, 70 years for any one of us. History speaks for itself. Your relatives, your families, your friends and mine have passed on at an early age. What was the benefit of them having focused on the dunya when they are not in the dunya for longer than they were in the dunya? Don't lose focus. We focus on the akhirah. The problem is while we focused in this world or on the worldly life, we tend to lose the focus of the akhirah. So when you have the opportunity of wearing the hijab out of the freedom that is afforded to you and you don't do that, you know what will happen? A day will come and it has come for others when it is banned whether you like it or not. Whether you like it or not, you're no longer allowed to wear it. If you wear it, we will jail you. It has happened in modern countries, first world countries. I'm sure you know the names of these countries. Subhanallah. Why? They have banned the fulfilling of prayer of Salatul Jum'ah unless it is within the building of the masjid. I've been to places where if one man is standing out of the mosque, they will be fined completely. They may even be shut down. So what do they do? They have to have a Jumu'ah starting off at 12 o'clock, perhaps when the time clocks in, another one at 12.30, another one at 1 o'clock, another one at 1.30, and another one at 2 o'clock. Why do they have to have four or five Jumu'ahs in the same masjid? Because so many people come that they don't have the space. And it's illegal to read or to fulfill the prayer outside the exact wall of that mosque. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. When we didn't have or we don't have those rules, we still don't go to the mosque. I, I have studied a lot of nations, a lot of nations. And I promise you the majority, I'm not joking, the majority now of the youth don't go for salah. Forget about Jum'ah or Eid, they don't. Check the capacity, check the population, look at how much happens at the day of Eid, count the number of people, check how many youngsters you have. And you will find me to be correct, even in beautiful nations where we enjoy our freedom. We are a minority actually pray in the masjid on a Jum'ah as well as on an Eid. Subhanallah. May Allah forgive us. The more developed we become, the bigger this problem is. I think for that reason we are lucky in this country. Because our problems keep us close to Allah. They should be. Every time you think something is about to get better and suddenly it gets worse, it gets worse, subhanallah. And then you think it's getting better and it gets worse. You know, you and I, we stand and we're ripping the prayer mat. Oh Allah, we need your help. Oh Allah, we need your help. And just about when you think things are happening, you've got to rip it again. Because there's some other thing that has cropped up. Allahu Akbar. We are going through a torrid time. I promise you, never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. There is a reason why Allah keeps us in this condition. And it's not always His punishment, although it can be. Sometimes it's to keep us within his obedience. Some people, when Allah gives them everything, 
Can I take the liberty of saying, a lot of people, when Allah gives them everything, they indulge in the luxuries such that they've forgotten Allah. وَإِذَا أَنْعَمْنَا عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ أَعْرَضَ وَنَآ بِجَانِبِهِ Allahu Akbar. Allah says, you know what? Man, when we give him a lot, we've favored him. He turns. He turns on his side. Subhanallah, he's gone the other way. Why? Because my car is in order. I've got the best one, the best house, the best this, no electricity problem, light doesn't go, bread, never mind, it's available at the shops, but it actually gets delivered to my house. How many ever loaves, hot, hot, subhanallah, it doesn't happen to us. I think we live in Zimbabwe. By the time they deliver the bread across the globe, the Z is right at the bottom, there's no more bread. Allahu Akbar. My brothers and sisters, may Allah grant us at least that bread. May Allah make us thankful. Imagine when there's no water in your tap, when there's no water in your tap for two weeks and suddenly it starts trickling, it starts trickling from the, from the tap, the smile that you have on your face, when you see a little bit of water suddenly come from that tap after two weeks, three weeks of a pause, how excited do we become? Wallahi, isn't that a moment of making sujood to Allah? But rather we say, using vulgar words, that you know what, these, and then we use that vulgar word, they should have sorted the problem out a long time back. Instead of saying, Alhamdulillah, the water is back. I think Muslimin still do that. I, I hope. But that's the favor of Allah. Allah wants to show you the ni'mah of water from a tap. The ni'mah of water from a tap is a luxury that is very recent. And it's only a few that enjoy that. Only a few. You know, there is an example I want to actually make mention of. A beautiful example. And I've said it many times. But I want to repeat it because it brings about a lot of comfort into my heart. You know, we are struggling. We must make use of the facilities we have. Because if not, wallahi, we are doing a disservice to it. Let's encourage our children, our women, in a beautiful way, to come to the house of Allah. Even if you may not have so many programs and so many things that are happening. So come for prayer. Come for the serenity. Come to the house of Allah to sit with Allah for a few moments. Come on. Just like I would come to your house if I'm close to you every day for a little while until my wife gets irritated. Right? But go to the house of Allah. No one will get irritated. Don't use that excuse to go somewhere else, by the way. May Allah grant us ease. But we must make sure, my brothers and sisters, that... We are thankful to Allah by making use of the facility Allah has given us. Right, let me explain to you. Who was the best of creation? The most noble of all prophets? The highest of rank without a doubt? Wasn't that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allah loved him the most. Still, Allah loves him the most. He is the highest of rank. He is the best. He is the top. Guess what? Guess what? In terms of facility and luxury, Allah gave you more than he gave him. Have you thought of it? You and I seated here today. And those who will listen to this. If you have the capacity and technology to listen to what I've said now. You have exactly what I said you have. In terms of luxury and facility. You had more than whom Allah loved the most. And Allah says, O oh Muhammad wasallam, If we wanted, we could have given you better than everything. Gardens with rivers flowing beneath. We could have given you. Allah chose not to. Did Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa did Allah choose for him to have water running from a tap? The answer is no. No. Does that mean his value was decreased? No, not at all. That means having water from a tap is not important. It's something minor. It's something, it's something Allah doesn't look at as important for your link with Allah. But if you don't have it, perhaps your link will be better. Did Muhammad, peace be upon him, have a mobile phone? Did he have internet? Did he have a phone? Did he have a stove? Did he have electricity? Did he have a car? Did he ever ride in a plane? Did he ever have anything you have? The material you have, the watches you have, the pens you have, the buttons you have, the technology you have, the internet alone, anything of that nature? The answer is no. But Allah blessed him way beyond all of us. Did you think of that? It goes to show everything we run behind today is of zero importance in the eyes of Allah. Zero. Nil. Nothing. Not at all. Have you thought of that? It's got to do with your relationship with Allah. Build it. Build it. You know why? Everything I mentioned now, you're going to leave it behind when you die. Totally. It becomes irrelevant. 
You can't receive a phone call from a dead person. It's not going to happen. No matter how, how technology advances, that's not going to happen. You can't get a message from someone in the grave saying, send me some airtime. It's not happening. No way. It shows you all of this is irrelevant. Your electricity, your water from a tap, your car, your aeroplane, whatever else, whatever technology. Allah says, تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي إِن شَاءَ جَعَلَ لَكَ خَيْرًا مِّن ذَلِكَ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِن تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارُ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكَ قُصُورًا بَلْ كَذَّبُوا بِالسَّاعَةِ Allahu Akbar. Allah says in Surah Al-Furqan that glory be to he who, if he willed, he would have given you, O Messenger, far better than all of that. Gardens beneath which are flowing rivers, subhanallah, and palaces, palaces and castles. Allah says, nay, they have belied the hereafter. They don't believe in the hereafter. And I'll end on that point. It's a reminder for you and I. Beautiful reminder. Remember what I'm saying is not in order to scare us, but it's in order for us to think, just to think. And to, to try and find our balance in this world that is filled with difficulty on one hand and the luxury on the other that we cannot reach and we are busy trying to reach, forgetting the focus on the hereafter that is actually coming even before we will get that luxury. May Allah grant us goodness. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's favor upon us is great. Allah has blessed us. Allah has bestowed upon us. Allah says to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that you know what? We have given you. We have blessed you. You are the highest in rank. You are on the best of character and conduct. We chose you from entire creation. And we decided to put you at a time when this technology was not available. In order for us all, my beloved brothers and sisters, to learn a lesson that it's actually got to do with your relationship with Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a good relationship with Him. May we be grateful. May we focus on the hereafter. May we focus on our character, on our conduct, on our deen. I really encourage you, my brothers and sisters, to greet one another with a smile. Greet one another with a smile. Please, greet one another with a smile. It is a starting point. Wallahi. And I'm repeating it for the fourth time. My brothers and sisters, please, I beg you from this minbar to do something simple. Today, as you're going away, don't forget one thing I've said. Only one. Greet each other with a smile. Genuine smile. It is the beginning of the increase of the love amongst you. You will feel like coming to the masjid because you feel like my family is there. My people are there. Those who love me are there. Unfortunately, when we come, we duck from this one, die from that one. We don't want to see that one. No matter what differences you have, greet each other. Smile at each other. Try it out. The Prophet وسلم, whom we love, we follow. He says, shouldn't I show you something? If you were to follow it, it would increase the love amongst you. Greet each other correctly. My brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fulfill our doors, meaning fulfill the goodness in our lives. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive our shortcomings. May He make us more conscious of who we are. May He help us to fill the masajid such that as the generations pass, we get closer to Allah. It's our duty. When we show the lack of interest in what belongs to Allah and what Allah has asked us to do, what do you expect from our children? When we show no interest, the children will actually discourage others from going closer to Allah. Learn your deen. Like I said earlier, there is ignorance that is there. Let's learn the deen. Let's put it into practice. And let's try our best to understand the goodness and the beauty that is going to help us not only in this world, but even in the hereafter.